Well, greetings, YouTube. Welcome back to uh, Three Marlitz Talks About Movies. <laughs> uh, I don't have a new review for you th uh, this time, though. I have a classic review of a classically bad movie. Yes, I'm talking about Super Mario Brothers, the movie, the live-action movie. So excited to see it. At least that was my reaction back in elementary school when this came out. And I became almost immediately disappointed. Not that even when I saw the film. Because my first introduction to this film was I knew the movie was coming out. I was excited about things. And so I ordered, you know, maybe some of the... No way, I think, no, we still, they still have these in schools. We remember, remember back then, maybe not every school district had these. But you get those little, like, cheap papers that had lists of books you could order... My parents, of course, encouraging me to uh, read it and stuff, would of course allow me to order one of those books once a month or something, or every two months. And they had, of course, in there, as part of the build-up to the Super Mario Brothers release, uh, a short kind of book on the movie, you know, that basically, talk about spoilers, it basically went through the entire plot <laughs> with pictures. And as soon as I kind of read through this, I was like, this is not Super Mario Brothers. No. And then, what, what year was that released in? It was released in 93. So at that time, I was 8. And I had, I was probably been playing, I'm trying to remember when I got my first, when I got the NES. I know it was in preschool when I got the NES. So, I had been playing Super Mario Brothers at that point for a good four years. Four, four to five years. Yeah, it was either my last or second to last year of preschool that I got Super at the NES, man. This good old Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunter and Mario Andretti Racing. Oh, yeah. No one ever remembers Mario Andretti Racing, but man the shit. <laughs> uh, but no, this this film really was a mess, and it, it's it's sad when an eight-year-old can look at it and go, wow, this is, this is bad. I didn't even bug my mom. I didn't even bug my mom to see it in theaters, so I didn't see it in theaters. I saw it later on, and I think we rented it from Blockbuster, and we were like, okay, and then I think like a year or two later, then I wound up taping it. And there are elements of charm to it, but I think this is the classic example of uh, how not to treat, treat a property. And actually, this is a lot of different classic examples. I mean, probably most famously with this is the, the actors, uh, Bob Hoskins and John Guzamo, apparently knew that this movie was going to suck and bomb. I believe both of them had a uh, was it? Well, I think it was. I think it was Bob Hoskins only did it because for his kids. But uh, they had quickly realized that this was a mess of a production. This was gonna be a mess of a movie, and basically didn't give a shit about their performances. Basically, this went. We'll, we'll get a paycheck out of this. And the, uh, Bob Hoskins to this day says this is the, his biggest regret. And John Linguizamo pretty much won't talk about this. And well, Dennis Hopper's not around anymore. Unfortunately, although Dennis Hopper is about the best thing in this film, then again, normally when Dennis Hopper is something, he's the best thing about the film. <laughs> uh, and first of all, they, all right, the Mario Brothers always famous as being Italian plumbers, and they made them plumbers in this. I mean, I have to give them credit there; they didn't fuck up to that big a degree. Although that's pretty much the very basic thing you would do in adopting anything. But who do they cast? They cast a British guy and a man of Latino origin to play two Italians. Eh? They couldn't find a single Italian actor that wanted to be Mario? It's a me, a Mario. Really, I mean, this was '93. The Italian film industry was still fairly strong. You tell me they couldn't go to Italy and find a single Italian actor. 
that's minor stuff. I mean, Bob Hoskins is good, and he put on an okay Brooklyn accent. And, well, John Linguizamo basically played John Linguizamo. But, I mean, you could tell they didn't care in their performances. They were bad. Well, not bad, bad performances. I mean, that kind of shows you what the degree of these actors like Bob Hoskins are. Even when they don't care, they still put in better performances than some of the other actors that were trying. But I think more importantly, more telling about how messed up this film is, and that I, I don't even think uh, when the uh, Nostalgia Critic reviewed this, he got into uh, this. There were four directors for this movie. Yeah. Two of which were uncredited. The the movie, and here's the funny thing is, all right, they got uh, Annabelle Jankin, uh, Jankel and Rocky Morton. Both of these guys have done nothing. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rocky Morton probably had the closest to having any type of experience in that he had uh, you know, done some uh, TV work and had done at least the film DOA. Uh, Annabelle Jenkins, she had... She had done music videos, a couple of music videos, and also co-directed on DOA. And has both of these guys since then have done virtually nothing. Uh, I think they they both did a few more music video type stuff, but their careers like sank big time, and for mostly good reasoning. I, I, well, let's see here. Actually, Annabelle had a couple of TV credits as well to her name before doing this, but man, although I, I think, oh, Annabelle's biography, though, and you can kind of tell that this was written probably by an agent of hers, but let's see if I can find this, unless somebody had finally gone on and fixed their IMDb page. Pulled it up. Where is it? There's a quote on here. Ah, yes, here we go. Uh, uh, Janko, Jank, this is a quote from her IMB, IMDb biography. Uh, Jenkel then made her move to Hollywood, where she co-directed DOA, a thriller starring Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid, which was praised for its quirky, Quicksilver-style. I haven't seen the movie, so maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But I question it, because we'll get into that in one second. Continue quote, uh, and earned two thumbs up from film critics Siskel and Ebert, and Super Mario Brothers a fantasy starring Bob Hoskins and Dennis Hopper was hailed as a hilarious was hailed as hilarious and exciting a cross between Indiana Jones, Blade Runner and Star Wars hailed uh, <laughs> hilarious and exciting no no hilarious maybe in that you're laughing at the movie not with it and yeah a cross between Indiana Jones, Blade Runner and Star Wars in that that's what the movies you were trying to rip off, but you failed ripping off. Yeah, if anyone's got an account on IMDb, change that right now to actually show the reality that they fucked up big time, and I should get an IMDb page here. I should get an IMDb account it's just to fix that and, you know, put in. They made Super Mario Brothers. It was a colossal failure, heavily criticized. Uh... Not only for its, you know, box office receipt, it was criticized by critics, was criticized by fans, did poor to box office, and was later revealed that they had barely, it had not handled the set well. And that's really the case with this. I mean, you had two, a team of directors here who had not handled a big project before, were just kind of given this, which is. You know, a lot of people say, why don't we have, you know, why doesn't Hollywood do more risk with, like, getting some of these younger directors out there? And this is kind of the reason why. Sometimes these younger directors can't handle big productions, and they get down. Now, the two, and apparently they also completely lost control of the set. They thought they were way bigger. Uh, One of the guys, I think it was Rocky, uh, apparently, like, got mad because of something with a coffee and, like, tossed the coffee on, like, a, a guy working there one of the stage crew, and that turned into a bit of a Hollywood scandal. Yeah, this gives you an idea. The people, they were... they were. This is, I blame most of the faults on these directors. 
and I'll get into a little bit more on that. But yeah, so there was that coffee incident, which became a bit of a Hollywood scandal, and basically, I think uh, Bob Hoskins had said like it was it was almost impossible to work with these directors. They they were just horrible. Didn't know what they were doing. And while they were all doing this, this isn't like oh they were too much pressure put them put on them by the studios. They were fighting the studios, and this is one of those instances where I can clearly say, you know what, the studios were a hundred percent fucking right. The studios went to them and goes, you guys, this is apparently the studios way <laughs> had a much better understanding of the uh, the source material, and were like, you, why is this looking like Blade Runner? This should be basically they wanted to make a more kid friendly fantasy film, which was their kind of original ideal. And I'm going to go, yeah, because they tried to make a Blade Runner film, which is nothing like Super Mario Brothers. And especially back in 93, it was clearly a kid's thing. Uh, you didn't have to make it all. I get, you know, my little, well, we'll put it, old school My Little Pony. You didn't have to be like that or Care Bears, but come on, man. Really, the Super Mario Brothers film should have been an animated film from the get-go, but, I mean, they decided to push for live action. It was an interesting experiment to try to do that, especially since, I mean, really when it, uh, Super Mario Brothers was made, it was made really by an artist as kind of an art project, which is why it kind of has these weird elements. We don't see them as weird anymore because Mario has become a modern classic, so the idea of a guy jumping on a mushroom and growing twice the size is normal for us now. It's part of our culture. But yeah, so at the same time, these guys apparently are losing control of their set, losing control of their actors. Um, imagine the films already as big-time Hollywood big shots who can do whatever the fuck they want. They then take that attitude and are fighting tooth and nail against good direction from the from the uh, from the studio. My God, the one time the studio decides to actually come up with a good idea, the directors go. Ooh, actually, it's not really the fair. A lot of times, studios do give very good direction and calls against directors. It's just that when they're right, the directors don't tend to mention it, or they tend to frame it in ways that, like, oh, we would have been so much better if this studio pushed us to go in this direction. They don't really fully explain normally what they wanted to do. And there's always that, well, potentially the director could have pulled it off. So, I mean, in reality, this is... It, I'll take the more mature route here. In reality, the studios, for as much as they fuck up, they also make good calls. And really, a lot of times, it's, you know, studios are these big anonymous organizations, so they, they don't, a studio doesn't sit down and talk with an interview, and rarely do top-level producers. One, because they're normally still in the business, they're handling other projects. And the the media doesn't really come to them as much as you know, the actual producer there, the onset producer, shall I say, and the directors. So, of course, the directors can normally spin stuff more towards their, their you know, their perspective. Uh, but enough about that. So, apparently, later on, they were brought they brought in uh, Roland Joffe, Joffe and uh, Dean Selmler. Selmler. Uh, everyone knows I can't do names sometimes. Uh, they were both brought in uncredited to, I guess, back up these two directors and try to get the, the production together. Uh, there was also apparently three writers for the script, uh, Parker Bennett, Terry uh, Runty, and Ed Solomon. I don't recall hearing those names from anything else. This, I, th Yeah, this was another... Pretty much everyone's careers were ended. It was a not a lot of experience. You had, you know, these guys uh, apparently did Mystery Date, The Princess and the Cobbler, uh, which was actually just additional story and dialogue, so they brought up they, for that, they were brought on, and then they did, their first real big thing was Super Mario Brothers. So you, I think you're seeing a bit of a theme here. Uh, Ed Solomon, I think, is the only, Ed, out of that crew, Ed Solomon's the only one that had uh, really any experience Actually, he had a decent, he had good experience. Uh, he had done TV work. He had done uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. He was a writer. He was uh, the writer on that. And he's the only one that was able to survive it. Even he had to take a uh, 
a four, a basically a four-year leave of absence before coming back with Men in Black. He, he's also done uh, Charlie's Angels, uh, Levity, and a couple of TV movies. Not the best of careers, but he was the only one that came in with some experience, and he's listed basically as the third writer, which uh, basically now it could be studio politics here, but that's basically I mean, I, he was probably just there to somewhat oversee. But I think we're, you're kind of seeing what the problem here was. The production, the guys behind this, did not have a lot of experience. And that's, I think that's a good demonstration. That's what you need. Now, sometimes you can luck out, like with Mortal Kombat, which is the only thing that salvaged the video game movie franchise. I think they only somewhat established that you could do a good movie-based video game because, let's face it, the first Mortal Kombat, which I should probably do a review about, was pretty much exactly what you'd expect from Mortal Kombat being made in the 90s. For the time, it was really great special effects. The plot followed the plot of the video game, and Mortal Kombat, believe it or not, at that time, had one of the more involved storylines. Uh... And that was by Paul W. S. Anderson, who did not have a lot of, uh, not he had some, but not a lot of directing experience at that time. I guess he's the counter somewhat. Maybe I'll get into a, uh, a thing on that. I mean, you've seen some of my uh, my reviews on Resident Evil, so. But I digress. Let's get back on to Super Mario Brothers, a much worse video game movie. Uh, now, surprisingly, as I said before with the cast. They actually got some good cast members. I mean, hell, even uh, Lance Hendrickson came in for a cameo as as the king, which was kind of a setup for a sequel, I guess. But uh, yeah, you know, I think that really goes to show it's more than this. And this is why actors. This is why I often say actors are overpaid, because real breakers of a movie are often those directors and writers. And this is a clear example where you bring in top level actors and the movie's just destroyed because you have crappy writers and crappy directors. Now, what the what are the problems with the film? Everyone's played Mario Brothers. Everyone knows what Mario Brothers. This instead has two different worlds. There's a there's a world where everyone has the dinosaurs somehow evolved into mostly looking like humans and have set up a Mega City. Really, that's what it is. There's one city on this entire planet, the rest of it's desert. I don't know how they supply their population with food or, uh, or water or any other type of resources. I mean, okay, mining you can do in the desert, yeah, but. So they have a desert. It's controlled now by Koopa, who had launched a coup, who was a descendant of the T Rex, and he's making Goombas via a de evolving people back into their more dinosaur-like forms, but not quite fully to dinosaurs. Those are your Goombas, and he wants to take Daisy back, so Daisy, who is played by Samantha Mathis, who's an archaeological student, because she has a piece of a meteorite that'll allow the two worlds to reunite, and the dinosaurs can then try to invade, which is, this is another one of those examples of, like, Threat to the Earth, not really, because, as I said in the movie, he's basically cool past control of the equivalent of Dinosaur New York with Devo guns, which basically devolves humans back into uh, monkeys. Now, slight problem is, you know, there's about six billion people. He probably only has a couple of thousand Goombas, and the Goombas can still be shot. Yeah, it's that's the funny thing. It's like their technology is not that much greater than ours, so you kind of wonder. It's it's almost like seeing that Tron Legacy. I, I want to see these guys fight. Tron Legacy. The guy had like one carrier with like eight fighters and like a dozen tanks on it, and maybe a couple thousand guys with sticks. Yeah, good luck fighting the military with that, buddy. You might last a whole ten minutes. But, long story short, Mario Brothers get their team up, beat Bowser slash Koopa. Actually, I think this is back. Back when this was made, it wasn't clear if Bowser and Koopa were two different characters. 
And I, I remember back then, King Koopa was the guy in the first one, and Bowser was the guy in the third one. And then later it was more clear that Koopa and Bowser were the same thing, that like King Koopa was King of the Bow uh, Bowser. But at the time we thought Bowser was Lance Hedrickson's character. Blech. But I described the movie for you. You've seen, I'm guessing if you've watched this, if you're watching this, you've probably seen the movie. So I don't think there was that much need for an explanation. But I mean, the idea of doing like a Blade Runner like city, it doesn't fit anywhere near Mario, which is clearly set in more of a medieval, not even quite medieval fantasy, but it's some sort of kind of more like a Wonderland like world where there's strange and unusual creatures. But there's some sort of fantasy medieval elements in there. There's castles, but it's normally very bright. I mean, that's one of the things that the games were, were very bright and wonderful colors and all that stuff. Instead, you have a drink, uh, a dank cyberpunk kind of world, which I'll admit that kind of look. I do normally kind. Of, I do like that look occasionally, and I deal the Goombas could have been scary if it was a completely different movie and there are some decent elements here or there and you're kind of feeling like if they had just decided to write an original screenplay and it's done an original movie that was more adult you know that it might have been all right but when you take and you're doing an adaptation of something that is not the time to just do your own thing there's updating an adaptation. Then again, this was still a new media, so no reason to really have to force an update. There's doing a kind of revisualization of an of a media, which you can do with you know certain things. I mean, when a story has been told several times, okay, I want to put Dracula in space. Okay, that's different ish, though it's been done actually. Now that I think about it. You know, you can understand that if it's a well-established thing, there's been a ton of Draculas. You can be like that Age of Dragons movie on uh, sci-fi where they decide to do, you know, let's do Moby Dick, but in a fantasy setting with dragons instead of whales. Okay. To a degree, considering how the film turned out, but the concept, you're not like, oh, my, Moby Dick doesn't have dragons, but when this is the first thing being made and it's only a couple years after the movie, after its material has been done... You know, unless you have really the big support of the creators, which I, Nintendo, I think, was just looking at and seeing dollar signs. It's not how you do things. And that, this is a classic demonstration of how not to adapt up things. And unfortunately, this was the first video game movie. Which really had caused people to question whether you could make a movie out of a video game. And you have to remember back into the 80s and 90s, games, video games were still primarily games. They had a rather simple objective. They didn't have much of a storyline. They had, you know, at the most you normally had a paragraph at the in the instructional manual, and then the basic plot was, I gotta save my girlfriend. Yep. Double Dragon. Super Mario Brothers. Uh, even, even the Mega Man series didn't have much of a plot. It was, bad robots. Stop them. Uh, fighting games were surprisingly probably the ones that had somewhat of a story because they had to develop... They normally had bios for each character. But even they didn't have much of a plot. Now, as time progressed, and, mo and video games, I would say, became more of an interact... truly an interactive experience where storytelling became you know really centered even in shooters I mean hell Call of Duty concentrates a ton on their stories you know, even though most people play it for multiplayer but there's a, at least a story context for everything it wasn't like that back then you know Call of Duty back then would have literally just been shoot shoot shoot, shoot, shoot. you wouldn't even know if you're actually shooting Russians if it was bad guys you probably would have said Russians have invaded Washington you must fight them that would have been it. <laughs> and I think it hurt it. Like I said, you had this came out, Mortal Kombat was at least... Uh, trying to think. I think Mortal Kombat was the next video game movie to come out, and it was okay. It salvaged it somewhat. 
at least for the fans. It didn't salvage it critically. Critics still, you know, bombasted it. That's not a great term, but, uh... uh critics didn't like it, but fans did enjoy it. It had a kick-ass soundtrack, and... It followed the plot of the games. Then you had Street Fighter, which is mostly only looked at positively now as for its camp value and for nostalgic purposes and all that. But it dragged for a while. And even to this day, there's a lot of bad video game adaptations out there. You can argue that, uh, you know, the Resident Evil franchise certainly isn't following the games anymore. But uh, I, I've done an entire video on that. But at least it's somewhat successful. It, it, it's found... Still not critical critical uh, reception. Silent Hill, I think, got a little bit of... Okay, this is an okay horror movie type reaction from most critics. Then again, critics have become increasingly irrelevant nowadays. Mainly because... Well, shall I say, people like myself where you have... Basically, you can now find people that are more in line with what you think of how films are. And there's a ton of us. Instead of, you know, full-time professionals. Although, most of us wouldn't mind being full-time professionals. I mean, hell. I wouldn't mind being paying the student movies every day. That'd be awesome. You can pay me 40000 a year, and I'll go and make a review for every movie that's out. But, uh, then again, there's about 2,000 other people that are willing to do the same thing in the state of New Jersey alone. But yeah, that I'm I'm now digressing into uh, critiques of critics, Ugh. which is probably a good indication that I pretty much said all I had to say with this film. Of course, I could really go in and nitpick it, but it's been done. That's been done. I decided to just give my opinions on uh, on the film, why it failed, basically how it's a good example of a top-down failure, where you had problems with an inexperienced and overconfident crew that wanted to do something completely different than what was needed for the film, and how it can fuck up. And it, it kind of shows where uh, it, it's a good example of just how how a, how a film can get fucked up, uh, based on how it's put together, what the people are doing, these type of conflicts. That's kind of why I decided to pick it. Well, stay tuned. Hopefully I'll have, a, I'll have another podcast up not too long from now. See you then.